So a lot of Piltover setting have been implied throughout Arcane, which is a good thing because we don't want many exposition dumps. But because information might be a bit hard to find, I made this video going over everything we know about Piltover as a city-state to prepare us for Season 2. I'm making a separate video for Zahn, so this video will just cover Topside. With that being said, let's just let it rip. Piltover was founded in part by Heimerdinger 200 years ago from the present day story, to escape from magic and mages and to build a utopian society built upon equality, innovation, and human potential. For the most part, Piltover embodies these traits today, not discriminating on race and valuing education and invention through its most prominent institution, the academy. With regards to industry, prominent businesses deemed impactful to society have their families be considered a lower house. This is evident as in episode 2, Mel directly identifies House Talis by their contribution to Piltover. I need something revolutionary, Alora. Something to put Piltover on the map. What of today's trial? His name is Jace of House Talis. A house? Remind me. They're toolmakers. I believe they came to renown for their design of the collapsible pocket wrench. Huh. Additionally, House Pharos is also noted to be successful because of their business. It seems that companies in Piltover are more of a family business and are handed down to familial successors. The government of Piltover is one of the most important aspects of Arcane. The council, as an entity, and their various policies resulted in the now split Piltover and Zon and all the conflict in between. The council is the main ruling body of Piltover, enacting legislative, judicial, and executive duties. It was founded on the constitution, as Councillor Shula referred to Zonites as Touch. They may not be your preferred constituents, but they're still our people. The council acts as the main government and deciding force of Piltover. The council has held seven seats for generations. It's possible there were more or less seats in the past, but seven has been the status quo for a while. Until Jace, the current seven councillors are Councillor Heimerdinger, Boldbach, Hoskel, Salo, Shula, Kiraman, and Madarda. Councillors use government resources for themselves too, as Heimerdinger has a laboratory and Mel has a painting room with a nice view of the city. When Jace became a councillor, the council made a motion to raise House Talis and give them a council seat through Jace's new position. Since Jace's mom, during the trial, addresses her house as only a lower house, this implies the existence of higher houses. Since House Talis is elevated to be able to hold a council seat, it means that higher houses consist of families that own a council seat. Heimerdinger doesn't have a family, so that gives only six actual higher house families. Subsequently, their House Bolbach, a race separate from humans, House Hoskel, with possible Noxon relationships via their trade in red clothing, House Salo and Shula, House Kiraman, who seem to do whatever they want, and House Medarda, that might be where Mel's father comes from. It's important to note that Mel might not be the only Medarda. Thus, since council seats are only rewarded to family members, I think it's highly likely that Jinx's nuke kills all the irrelevant council members, that being everyone but Jason Mel. This would carry into the war narrative of Season 2, as each family might delegate a more radical representative to create a warmongering council that want revenge for the deaths of the last generation. When it comes to council duties, we are shown clear examples of legislative, judicial, and executive powers. The council gave Jace a trial, but this might only pertain to legal issues of lower houses and above. I don't see Zonites getting to speak to the council on trial. The council also makes the laws of the land. It's unclear whether the ethos are rules pertaining to Piltover or just academy research. I'm going to assume that it's just for the academy, as ethics are more relevant to substantive work rather than legal issues. Speaking of the academy, Heimerdinger serves as the dean of the academy. However, he seemed to abandon those duties when he got evicted from the council, so it's unclear whether the dean is inherently a duty of the council. Councillors also have their own defined roles. The only two roles we know of are Heimerdinger being dean and Jace in charge of Hextech security. It's possible that other sectors such as law, environment, urban design, and industry are supervised by other councillors. Councillors are also given special privileges able to basically do whatever as Jace killed a kid with no repercussions. Conflicts do occur between counselors and are settled by majority votes to any action in question. When it comes to expanding or shrinking the council, a unanimous vote is necessary. However, in most cases, such as a criminal trial or legislative decisions, they only need a majority. Finally, executive duties are shown as the council commands enforcers to do various duties, whether that be creating blockades, searches, warfare, etc. Speaking of the enforcers, 
Let's talk about them. The enforcers serve as the main center of national security, defense, and as the police force of Piltover and Zon. In League, they are called the Wardens, but we haven't heard that name yet. They are headed by the Sheriff, who has absolute say within the hierarchy of power. They answer directly to the counselors. The counselors can direct them as a group or individually. Jace ordered a charge into a shimmer factory without the others being aware of it and called it unsanctioned activities. But it seems that the Sheriff also has some swaying power in their actions. Marcus was able to be corrupt with little oversight, and Grayson was able to hold back alley deals to ensure peace. I think the enforcers are just given blank orders and do whatever necessary to ensure the desired outcome. There seems to be little due process for the Zonites, just being able to be freely interrogated, brutalized, and arrested. They are thrown into Stillwater prison, similar to Alcatraz in the middle of the ocean. Stillwater has at most 40 levels, with Vi being confirmed to be in the basement floor 40 corridor. Prisoners are given clothes, food, loose medical attention, and new clothes if they're released. There also seems to be a tattoo parlor inside. For Academy Affairs, confiscated materials are temporarily stored in Heimerdinger's laboratory. Enforcers can also serve as firefighters if need be, and any enforcers killed in the line of duty get a funeral service. When a sheriff dies, they might get a shrine. Moving over to Piltover's esteemed academy, I think it would be safe to say that this institution is the premier hub of academia in all of Runeterra. It's unclear how independent this institution is from the council, as Heimerdinger is both a dean and a council member. We never really see Heimerdinger do anything pertaining to his duties of a dean. His assistant, Victor, at least does some stuff, like investigating academy infractions. Breaking the ethos may lead to some penalties. For Jace, who was experimenting with unauthorized machinery and dangerous materials, he was initially going to be banished, but was later expelled from the academy. The academy consists of students, and graduates normally become inventors. The highest non-administrative role is a senior inventor, whose success rate of innovations are pretty low as explained by Jace. Inventors receive some funding from the academy, but I think the academy just provides resources. Patrons fund the bulk of research, coming in as pledges from houses to an inventor. Some donate out of altruism, some do it for special privileges, and some do it as an investment on the product of the inventor. The Kiramans funded Jace's research in hopes his inventions will bring about great contribution to Piltover. For extremely successful inventors such as Jason Victor, whose Hexec technology single-handedly skyrocketed Piltover's importance, they seem to have infinite resources, being able to have massive labs and faculty with blueprints constructed immediately. Victor also mentions artisans who might also be members of the academy. Initially, Piltover's economy stems from intellectual property created by the academy, while the domestic economy is fueled by house industries. Piltover had a very localized economy until the hex gates opened. Following the hex gates, Piltover became a global shipping lane and all the countries would use Piltover as a junction for shipment. Piltover used to have a small trade center and a port by shipping goods through the fishers, but those have been abandoned since the hex gates. The hex gates provided thousands of jobs from port managers to operating engineers. Through the hex gates, we observe Runeterra be more globalized and domestic goods are more accessible to outside countries. For example, the smuggling operation implies outside parties are purchasing shimmer. The increased demand of shimmer given access to broader markets means that Silco and the Kembarens can achieve larger profits and influence. It's interesting how Silco and the Kembarens aren't given a house given their creation of internal industry, but then again, their goods are illegal. Some trade does happen between Piltover and Zon, but I'll tackle that in the Zon video. Most importantly, Piltover can set up blockades against Zon to prevent transfer of individuals and resources. Finally, Jace mentioned shutting down the hex gates and refinery. I assume the refinery is for processing hex crystals to be accessible energy sources for the hex gate. Overall, Piltover's academy is heavily reliant on the success of the hex gates, so it makes sense why its safety was deemed important enough to warrant giving Jace a council seat. The politics of Piltover is a mess, much like with any country. It's essentially an oligarchy within the council. Jace, when given the council seat being in charge of Hexec security and operations, begins intercepting illicit transactions. Given that a lot of prominent houses partake in illicit trade, Jace made himself an enemy of the Piltover noble class. Mel helps Jace navigate through his situation by striking deals with families and counselors to restore privileges in exchange for their political sway and investment. 
Corruption is inherent within the Piltover government. Heimerdinger, in his last council meeting, discusses the prevalence of corruption in the council and the necessity for the council families to unite again. However, this was a major blunder, as Heimerdinger, going against all the corrupted councillors under the influence of Jace, becomes everyone's enemy and gets himself evicted. Mel notes that Jace's position and power is extremely sought after, especially since everyone else has only to gain from dealing with Jace, and Jace doesn't really need support from anyone else. Subsequently, Jace takes hold as the head of the council and supplants Heimerdinger. It's important for councillors to uphold their image to maintain good relations with other councillors and houses. Jace's initial conviction warns the Kiramans to disassociate with him. Miss Kiraman also reprimands Caitlin for ruining their image by sneaking off into the underground and breaking several laws. Going on a tangent, I'm confused about what exact laws Caitlin broke. Parkouring without a license? Since under Marcus, the enforcers have been less vigilant over Zahn, I doubt any of her activities in Zahn are made aware to the government and the public. And her only actions in Piltover have been freeing Vi as they go to Zahn immediately after. I can see Caitlyn being charged with impersonating an officer as she lost her position after Jinx's attack, but that doesn't consist of several laws. In Zon, she doesn't really do anything illegal except for assault with a deadly weapon and buying drugs. Maybe Marcus made up some lies about her to give him a reason for killing her to cover his ass? Whatever. Also, the tumultuous state of Piltover also reflects on other countries, as Councillor Hoskell complains about his associates not wanting to trade with him anymore. Finally, it's important that council members get scheduled as to what they do that day, as Mel was briefed about Jace's trials among her duties that day. Councillors are able to enact influence over the schedule, as Caitlin's mom was able to push Caitlin and Vi's meeting the following day. It's safe to say that there's corruption in this process also, as prominent families can push their matters to an earlier date. Finally, let's discuss the society and culture of Piltover. They seem to be very Parisian, with topside architecture very reminiscent of Paris. Piltover seems to value education and invention, attracting scholars and inventors from all over the world. Their founding day, which is dubbed Progress Day, is essentially the 4th of July for them. They have a fair where inventions are showcased and they circle jerk how cool their society is. Music and art are just as valued as science. Local cuisine exists too, whether that be food, drinks, cupcake, or friends. Amenities and activities include bathhouses and hunting competitions. Nobles also host parties where the upper class network, whether that be a house party or watching an orchestral performance. Overall, the Piltover guys are kinda stuck up and dry as they don't do a lot of interesting stuff compared to Zahn, so that's basically all we know about their society and culture. Piltover is arguably more important of the two cities, especially since it's technically the main city. The government and politics of Piltover determine everything that has happened in Season 1. The world building is exquisite, as we get a sense of cultural identity different from the other regions of Runeterra. Piltover really comes into its own as a nuanced city. However, since most of the ground level stories take place in Zaun, we get a better sense of Zaunite lifestyles than their average day compared to the privileged and specific lifestyles of the Piltoverans we follow. So, that's my video about Piltover. I hope you guys enjoyed, you learned a lot. If there's any information I missed, I, I'd be glad to update the video. Let me know in the comments below. And yeah, the, 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 this kind of felt like a lecture, oh blah blah blah, this is what Piltover is. But I think it's important to understand the council and just how everything operates so we know how war is going to take place during Season 2. I hope you guys enjoyed. I might have said that already. I hope you guys enjoyed. And I'll catch you guys in the next one, yeah?